and uh, PhD in computer science from Berkeley. And I could just stop saying by saying that Hannes is the running president of the Association for Computing Machinery, which we all know is the largest uh, organization for computer science professionals with over 100,000 members. But let me still say a few more words about Hannes. About Hannes. He's uh, uh, not only uh, at the uh, National uh, Capodistro University of Athens a professor, he's also affiliated to the Athena Research and Innovation Center, which he also ran as president for uh, 10 years. Uh, Yanis is well known for his research in data management. He uh, addressed uh, many topics related uh, to data, text management, uh, data science, text analytics, uh, data federation, data infrastructures, recommendation system, and recently moved also to personalization and human computer interaction. And uh, he's not only known for his uh, foundational research and uh, many technical results that he gave, but also by the fact that his uh, research results have been applied in many areas, uh, 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 surrounding areas of computer science and gave important contributions. So uh, his research is uh, used in industry, social sciences, humanities, life sciences, physical science. And uh, in that sense, uh, Yanis uh, uh, had a strong impact uh, on the community in general, and this impact is also recognized because he took uh, on many leading roles uh, at the international level. For example, he's uh, coordinator of the Open IRA uh, project in Europe, which uh, promotes uh, uh, open data, and uh, he's also software director of the Human Brain project, which is one of uh, the EU flagship projects, and he has many important roles uh, in uh, several uh, projects, uh, uh, also um, supported by the many publications uh, uh, in important journals and conferences that he had over the years. And let me just conclude by saying that he's a fellow of the ACM, of the IEEE, and also a member of Academia Europea. And Yanis will talk now, uh, tell us something about his uh, research in uh, uh, human-defined functions and Specifically, we will talk about the ESQL, which is the system uh, that is being developed in the school. Thank you, Yannis. Pleasure to have you here. Thank you very much, Dekwe, uh, uh, for the nice introduction. It's a great pleasure to be here. Uh, it, uh, it took me 31 years to make it. To send to be the one other, uh, 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 some other opportunity that I was invited to come and unfortunately it didn't work out. And even this time, unfortunately, the timing was such that I will only be here today, tomorrow morning, even slightly missing to this presentation. I would have to leave. So uh, you have to ask me to come back so I can enjoy a full, a full set uh, sometime in the future. Um, so, uh, uh, I mean, you had my interest and in the things that I have worked on or I am working on. Uh, today, I will, uh, uh, I will talk about uh, one of the more technical, I would say, uh, areas that I've been working on with, with my people, and that's um, uh, user-defined function relational databases. So I'll present in general, you know, what are we talking about, why is it an issue? Uh, and then I'll talk about the particular effort that we have with uh, with the with the SQL, and and this is what I do uh, during the night, uh, during the day. I try to uh, uh, to do something uh, uh, in ACM, and then I'll say a few things about that. So uh, uh, none of this would be here without uh, uh, this particular four guys who through the years. Some are still in my team, some others have worked on this on this particular issue. Um, but my team is very large on the various elements, and, and this particular team happens to be non majors but my team mm -hmm. is very diverse, so uh, I really care about that. So, motivation since the beginning of time, uh, well, the database time, but in general, okay, but, 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 even, but even now. Um, uh, general application and also in particular the last uh, years data science uh, pipelines uh, need to uh, have complex processing, uh, which is not data processing, but still that processing has to be done on, on data that is stored in database and other diverse data sources. 
So we have the processing on one end and the data access on the other end. And that's a gist of the problem. And this has, has, has started as an issue uh, from the 60s and the 70s. And when, when I was a student and I started learning about database, immediately there was the issue when you have the C program, the Fortran program, the, the COBOL program, and as SQL started to be uh, uh, there, how do you put it? Usually you had special symbols, and whenever there was an SQL query, uh, uh, you would put it there. So that's the problem. Is it still an issue? Yes, it is still an issue. And I'll use the use case, uh, the one that uh, uh, Diego mentioned, uh, open air. Open air is a data infrastructure that is running Europe. I've been coordinating it for the past 15 years, which tries to implement the open access policies of Europe for anything that is produced from a research effort funded by public money. Uh, and that's publications to begin with, but also data set software and so on and so forth. It has a whole bunch of um, functionalities that, that system. And uh, 65 institutions have been working on this, but all, all the technical staff, uh, a, a thousand, more than a thousand data sources that are in harvest to, to create all this. And it's very active, uh, 42 million uh, visits the last year. And uh, it, it is the one that is bringing open science in what is called, in case you know, the European Open Science Cloud. Which is trying to serve for, as, as a platform for all this. And you see some nice pictures of what open air produces. Uh, I'll come back to open air towards the end. But this is one production query that we are at. Uh, let me turn my laser pointer on. Okay. So this is the actual query. Okay. And this is a snippet. And you see this select blah 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 the way we teach it in our know, undergraduate courses. But all these red things, six eleven in this particular little snippet, are calls to 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 Python, are calls to programming uh, language. So you need to have the access to that data manipulation, but you cannot do everything. So you have to, to go there. So it's not slow pattern. It's not something that happens once in a while. You see, you know, in fifteen lines of SQL code, you had to go out. So it's a real problem. So if you ask people who are not enlightened like us, database people, and how do they do their data science pipeline? They say, oh, I'll take Python, I'll grab the data, bring them all to memory, and, and then I'll just run my Python. Okay. And there are extremely powerful tools that, that allow you to do this. But the whole set of tools that exist, you know, every two weeks, another one pops up, and this doesn't scale. We, we know that from the 60s, they, they know, but we know this, this doesn't scale. This doesn't scale. So you have expressivity and, and, and uh, uh, debugging ability is very high, uh, but uh, on the optimization, the scalability, this doesn't work. Okay? At some point, they will understand. They say, okay, let's do it relational uh, database. Uh, uh, we are very efficient, on, of course, on, on data processing, but this really is not very complete. We cannot express everything. In so, yes, uh, uh, on the other side, expressivity, the tool that we have, nobody likes uh, to write as well. Even the hardcore, you know, SQL groupies, uh, you know, they, they write it, it's fine, they, 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 but, but, but they, that's not a pleasant thing. Uh, so, what is the solution? Try to merge the two. And, and the, the, the running uh, uh, game in town is have user defined functions in a programming language embedded into uh, SQL. Well, this is a sound effect. Uh, it's important what I said. Uh, you merge the, the semantics of the syntax of the
the key thing is that a user-defined function definition, here is a Python call that defines it, would be gray, uh, a blue, uh, will be what the system uh, uh, produces from uh, uh, looking at the definition, uh, a combined time, if it is uh, uh, statically defined, or at runtime, if it is dynamically typed, and then the yes query query in runtime, someone submits a yes query query, what, what happens? And that if it is compile time static, this is produced at compile time and then it's used to, to run whatever it's run at runtime, at dynamic, if it's dynamic type, this is how it works. Um, so now to get to graph the idea, here is a Python code. Later on, I'll ask you what, what it does. I won't, I won't do it uh, now. Um, uh, so it removes uh, some, some uh, punctuation or all the uh, punctuation marks from, from, from text. Um, and then this now goes into something that connects it with C. And, and this is, uh, uh, again, I'm just showing you the, the complexity. Of course, I won't, I won't go into this, but there's a little bit of, piece of code that is produced. And uh, these three elements are Python C and uh, uh, the, uh, the interface, and uh, they are in a loop. And this is, uh, uh, whereas if we didn't do that, every single call would be different. Now, by being in the loop, they're all called together. And from this, you create, uh, depending on the database that you have, this is the code form on NDB. If you had Postgres, if you had Oracle, it would be something else. Uh, uh, you define uh, a function in, in the database system. And then when, when a query comes in, this is what you bring together, which is already embedded and has, has embedded UDF into the function. And, and um, uh, you see, I mean, this is the, the dirty thing that by doing it within GraphQL, someone else has to deal with it. You see there's a C part, a Python part, and from the interface, a C for the function interface. Um, uh, uh, it's it's uh, this is done in the in the fourth basement, you know, dirty water everywhere. So it, this is the dirty stuff that we have done to give you. Yes, you know, yes, exactly. This is offering. So I mentioned three types of criteria: usability, expressiveness, and um, uh, performance. Let me talk for the first two. I won't go into the details, of course. Just just. Uh, uh, relevant. This is a real-world query from OpenAir again. This takes uh, a whole bunch of uh, text uh, from the corpus, from the digital library, uh, and, and, and so on, and uh, tries to find uh, which publication will be funded by the National Science Foundation of uh, the U.S. and find the project, the NSF funded project that, that it is. So this is uh, how it's written in SQL. I want to write a final code. Much, much longer. Uh, you see a, a bunch of uh, user defined functions that need to be uh, 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 written here. Uh, and uh, also, how you can have fusion if you have text window and keywords, one user defined function on top of the other. Instead of having two function calls, you can fuse them. More often than not, not always, but you we do programming language analysis and we see if it can be fused and then it becomes uh, uh, one call and uh, uh, this is another instance of this and also we have you see this is an SQL query it doesn't look like SQL because I said we have the function of the query syntax mm -hmm. so we have a sample uh, uh, user defined function operating on the output of the file user defined function and the input is a JSON file so uh, that, that comes from there so um, this is the kinds of things that you can see. And, and uh, on the expressiveness, uh, uh, I'll just hit one little example for, for each of the characteristics. Um, we have dynamically typed uh, UDFs. So you say add, arg1, arg2. It doesn't say what arg2 uh, would be. It can be numbers. And then internally, we cast the result as a number. Or it can be hello world, it can be a different one. And this uh, uh, allows us to do things that are not expressible otherwise. Uh, stateful, you can have a global state and you can keep it. Python doesn't have that. It's a nightmare to do this uh, with Python, but we've yeah, done it uh, 
for you. Um, and the functional syntax I, I showed an example before. Here it is instead of select from, here is one user defined function, and then select from, here's another one. You can just say JSON parse uh, uh, file this. And this is not, there's not fusion here. You can even reduce it more to fusion. Um, parametric polymorphic uh, authors. What do authors have? Do they have just a name or do they have a name and decide? This is what brings it. And then um, uh, uh, the, the four types uh, I, I mentioned it later. When you want to talk about usability, uh, uh, technologists and computer scientists who develop the system say, oh, it's very usable. No, it doesn't count. You have to bring in users, actually breathing users, not ChatGPTs and, and, and these things, actual users to see. Uh, how they behave. So we've run uh, uh, a, a limited experiment still with a few hundred students and we gave them the task. Here is YesQL and here is SQL and Python separately. Here are some tasks, do them. And then we measured a whole bunch of things. I won't be showing the detailed results, uh, how long it took them, how many errors, how many were successful, and so on and so forth. And very high percentages I completed the stuff successfully, much lower when they didn't have SQL. And uh, there were people that knew Python and SQL, but and SQL was just one more step to learn, but the learning curve is, is not steep at all. And, and they had almost half of them get a high screen, so it was uh, very successful. So the visibility, we need more studies, but still with 300, some students, it's good enough. Of course, we database people leave and die with performance. How can this work? Um, as I mentioned, there are a whole bunch of things that we do in order to achieve performance. Uh, everyone, this is a starting point of, of the of the non-enlightened people. You know, they just go take Postgres or MySpark, and and they do uh, uh, something like this with user-defined functions. These are just numbers from a particular uh, simple cell uh, 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 yes, well, uh, query. Um, and then when you start adding vectorizer and tracing sheet and then parallelization and then you diffusion and then stateful and there's only a particular order that you can do this, you see you start from 1,156 milliseconds and you end up in 34. So there's a huge, uh, huge gap. Uh, and and uh, uh, you can try them in a different order, just choose first this and then that, but some of them have to happen in in this particular order. UDF fusion is a very important uh, element. When you have multiple, lots of user-defined functions, reducing their number by fusing them pays a big role because of the function calls, the data transfers, the context switches, and, and, and so on. It's not easy to do because you have to do programming analysis and in theory, this is undecidable. You cannot really know if it stops, but you can do a bunch of things. And that's what we do. And um, uh, uh, if we have, for example, uh, here is uh, two user-defined functions, one that looks for the length of something and adds one to the length of its input. These are two. And someone says, select add of the length of C1. You have two functions right there, it's a simple example. Well, the translation that I showed, of course, this has to happen at runtime because the fact that you're using the two is only at the runtime query that you get. And, and, and this is the, the thing that you do at the C for a function interface. And, and uh, you rewrite it as, as, as uh, one after the other. And eventually you get this SQL query that um, uh, uh, gives you one, one function, which is at length, okay? And, and this looks very simple, but it works miracles in terms of uh, performance. And this is a very simple thing where you fuse one uh, um, user-defined function that produces one value with another one that's like that. Uh, the, the, the fun starts when you have more complicated things. A scalar with a table, a scalar with an aggregate, or a table with an aggregate. What? Yes, a table with an aggregate. And OK, these are user-defined functions that you're starting to, to play with them. But the relational operators are also functions in some sense. I mean, it joins, it actually 
so on. And you bring in together and start playing with fusing and exchanging uh, uh, and exchanging uh, uh, the position of a UDF with a relational operator. That's the future. <coughs> so there's the present, we've done a lot of work with that, but it's still more to work. And, and so you can see a UDF with a UDF, okay, you get a fused UDF, but you have UDF and relational. Can you fuse them together? Or have UDF, relational UDF composed in, in your plan? Well, if, if you can commute relational with UDF and bring this first, then you have UDF, UDF, and then you may be, you can be able to fuse. So there is the space of opportunity for optimization growth dramatically. And uh, in the interest of time, um, um, uh, let, let me skip this, how we do this uh, in the system. Uh, by the way, the, the example that I'm showing here is, you see, it's one one standard uh, uh, SQL query, a bunch of user-defined functions, you see them, it's a full program, and you take them, we analyze them, we bring dynamic programming to see what makes sense, and you see a whole bunch of UDFs here after we change it that can be fused, and then a whole bunch of others here. We fuse them, and then we run them, and, and we, we, we produce this that we run, and it's much faster. Uh, some experimental results, because again, by claiming that it's faster, it doesn't mean anything. Uh, we've done a quite extensive evaluation with a whole bunch of data sets and queries and so on and so forth, um, uh, uh, including TPCH, but also queries from, from uh, uh, that other uh, uh, prior work is used or we have found in, in open air. And here's the results of 13 GraphQL queries that we've tried. Uh, here you see how many uh, uh, user defined functions each one had, and uh, uh, how many, uh, I mean, it started, you know, from six, we ended up fusing four of them. We started from 14, we ended up fusing nine of them. So you see that the, the, uh, how much we can do. And then uh, uh, the, the fusion optimization and, and the code generation, meaning uh, it's uh, uh, negligible in terms of cost. Compile time takes more or less standard between 300 and 700 milliseconds, depending on the complexity. But look at the runtime. It's four days of one, it's three days of one, it's faster. Of course, for simple queries, may just be, I mean, compile time may be a little bit more overhead, but still less. So we win big. And the key thing, the, the, the key performance aspect that I want to show you is that if we start with uh, uh, PL Python with Postgres, and we try a bunch of with PySpark or Spark, uh, uh, DBX is vertical. Uh, now the, 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 the rabbit is out of there. Um, and, and then we start various types of SQL. Pandas is here. Tuplex, which is the champion, kind of the compiler uh, version. Only Python. Tuplex has been written in Python, there's no database. Um, uh, uh, and we recently you know with Harmony DB and SQL implementation with PyPy. So it has a cheat and everything. You see, it's a factor from one to 68. And even tablets is six, six times uh, uh, slower. Pandas is 10 times slower. So I think we've achieved something uh, that, that, is, that is worth it. And, and if you look at the fusion, which I said, it's, it's, a, it's a big issue. <clears throat> uh, uh, this is just a plain query without fusion, or yes, without fusion. And yes, but with fusion, you see it's roughly about three times speed up. Uh, but it takes a, a way to analyze the, the problem. So, so for YesQL, not done yet as I promised, uh, it, it's, uh, it brings in, addresses the impedance mismatch. Uh, it's, it's a big problem still. Forget YesQL. We at YesQL I and mean, others are working on this issue. And I think there are many more problems to be worked on. So, if you're looking for it, um, uh, page stage or to get your hands dirty, you know, in basement four. Uh, I think it's it's a very worth it because it has an impact. Uh, yes, the promise is expressed in the optimization. I gave you a glimpse of this, and the fusion seems to be a key for that. We are, my team and I, are working on, on a few things like fusion-based optimization. 
and exhausted everything that can be done. Uh, uh, still, people will not will never be enlightened, and they will want to write on Python. So, okay, fine, but can you take the Python code and translate it into JavaScript that is correctly, uh, probably uh, equivalent? Easier said than done. Okay, we, we're trying to work on that. And then, what if you don't have you know one data table, a federated thing, it's heterogeneous, and, and you have a, a UDF that touches upon things in various places, maybe privacy preservation and preservation. So, we'll see that. Uh, here is a bunch of papers, our code is open source, of course. And as I said, JSQL is in practice in a bunch of projects that we have, we use it, we offer it, but also it is in open air. But as I said, is the infrastructure that operates, that, that, that uh, serves uh, open science policy in, in Europe. And it's used to harvest data, classify, apply a whole bunch of machine learning techniques that have been that have been written. Um, open science, what is open science? Well, um, I assume that everyone knows what is open access. Right? By now, when you publish, they ask you, do you want it open access to play the access processing costs or uh, your university pays them and so on. There are various models. And we're in a transition period. By, by uh, currently in Europe, you cannot uh, uh, get funding and publish a paper from public funding project unless you openly uh, uh, you publish in an open access way, uh, more than one way, and by January first, twenty twenty six, by uh, mandate of uh, uh, OSTP uh, in the US will be the same thing. But open science is more than just having openly the research results, data sets, data sets included, right? And don't do just uh, publication. It's a new paradigm of operating. And if you look at this uh, United uh, UNESCO picture of open science, uh, only one aspect is open access to the research results. Um, uh, you, you need to go into open infrastructures and use them, and not everyone have a cluster in their backyard. Use open infrastructures, uh, open educational resources, of course, open data, uh, open notebook, open reviews, uh, bring it in a way so that it's open to the citizen science. So it's a whole bunch of different aspects on how we run open science. But the goal is that to promote collaboration, reproducibility, our holy grail, where we often fail miserably. Although our database community is one of the pioneers in, in, in trying to do that. And transparency and trust, these are the results of having them in the open arena. Um, so this is what everything that should be uh, open. Um, and, and in order to do this, essentially your publications down the road in n years, whatever n, but it's not 20 or 30, it's coming sooner, will not be just a piece of text and a piece of pictures. It will be a, a, a live document. It will connect with your data. It will connect to your software so that you can someone can run it again and see it. And, and uh, both open air and other public research infrastructure, but also commercial providers are working for that. And hopefully the public will. This is the open research life cycle. You start from hypothesis. And by the way, this is not just for data or computing science. It is for all sciences. What open science is not just for us. Uh, physics, chemistry, the humanities, social, everyone is moving in open science, both by governmental mandates, but also bottom up from the need of, of the people. Uh, so you, someone has a hypothesis or I'll prove that yes, well, is faster than everyone else. And then you start collecting data. Well, in, in the fourth paradigm of science, often we don't have a report. We just start collecting data and then we mine uh, the world out of them and see what, what proves this. This is something that we did and, and Jim Gray was, the late Jim Gray was instrumental in this. So I, I won't go through this, but I want to, to point, um, that means that before you have results, you say, I'm working on this problem. Why would you ever do this? Where would competition go? Well, maybe someone says, oh, I'm working on this problem. Do you want to work together? And then we can join forces. Or someone says, oh, you are working in, and what is your method that you're doing? And you data, I've only been this and it failed. 
Okay, so we don't do it again. Okay, because it's only in the open. It may be for education of people, but it may also be in the open. It's a very different mindset for us doing our research and, and doing our job. And it won't happen in one day. And, and there are many social challenges and assessment challenges that we have to overcome. And we'll see where we'll end up. But, but this is a, a broad avenue that we need to be working on. Um, and, and, and you see, the, the things that I, I, I uh, uh, subscribe with my red uh, box, they have a lot to do with data. Uh, so uh, make use of open source software as much as you can. Uh, attach, uh, don't just create data and put it out there. You have to spend time to get your metadata in, in order. Um, uh, uh, make sure that what you produce will be there 50 years from now for someone to reproduce it. Okay, five. Okay. For other sciences, 50 is nothing. For us, five is, is already, but still. Okay. Um, and none of this can happen without computing. So our entire field is there to support open science in general. And none of this such computing can be done without data. So we, we are needed there, not just to serve, but also to, to change the way we, we cook, the way we, we do work. Uh, and and uh, well, these are, let, let me skip this since we were late. This is a new way to do open publications. We can talk for hours on this. Um, but let me touch upon an issue that, that is the most difficult. Open reviews. We were, we used to be single anonymous. Okay, the paper had the authors and the reviewer was hidden. The author didn't know the reviewer. And then we say it is unfair because you see the name of uh, Julia. Say, ah, it will be good. I don't read it. Yes. Or you see Julia when you have you know, a fight and uh, Julia. No, you find some excuse and, and, and you kill Julia's paper. Okay. Uh, therefore, there's a double anonymous. You don't know who the reviewers are. Of course, what people do to, to circumvent this, it's a horror story, is, you know, give me enough wine, and I can tell you many, from my essay on presidency hat. But open science says go in the other direction. Zero anonymous. The authors of the paper are open, and the reviewer signs the review and puts it up in the open says, This is what I believe. And so everyone sees. If you're a one-liner, I don't like Julia, okay, everyone will jump on you, okay? But if you're like, yeah, but Julia did this, whereas, you know, in the other section, uh, the, the paper has a whole bunch of justification, you cannot hide. Of course, on the other hand, uh, 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 Diego is a senior person, sees, I don't know, uh, uh, Maria is a junior student from another place and, and says something bad about Diego's paper, and then when her paper shows up, or when uh, uh, she has asked for a promotion letter, Diego really. Uh, so there are social issues, nothing to do with technical, but technicals. So how do we do this? We need transparency. We need, this will improve quality. This will change the way we assess people or departments and so on and so forth. It's a great challenge, but we need to be working on it. Open Air does, uh, uh, tries to do this, uh, tries to support all of the things that have to do with open science, both on its own and as one of the major contributors to the European Open Science Cloud. Uh, uh, 35 countries participate in it, everyone from the European Union. It's led by uh, Natalia Manola, Athena, and your own Paolo Manchi from ISTCNR, CEO and CTO. It is a legal entity. Uh, it's a, it's a non-for-profit company that runs this, so it's not a project, so it has been there around for 15 years, and for five as a legal entity to continue. And if you look at how it produces things, this is the data flow. It has a, a research graph that uh, connects not just publication with authors, but also publication with citations, a publication with a project that uh, funded. Uh, the funding agency, and we have uh, close to 30 funding agencies. The European Commission was the first one. 
But then we have a whole bunch of national funding agencies, including the NSF, the US, uh, 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 from Latin America, America, Korea, and so on and so forth. All of this coming together, building a graph way more complex than the, the Microsoft Academic graph was, because we include a whole bunch more entities. It's a very hard job, but we are building it, and now it has 140 million publications, 5 million data sets, and so on and so forth. And this is where, what does this guess about have to do with this, this uh, uh, enrichment and analysis that we are doing after we clean the data and we duplicate it. This is where all the yes code is written and it's applied every, I'm not sure now, every week, every two weeks for the new things to, 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 to increase that, uh, that the thing. So, and by the way, in open science, Europe is leading in general, both of the efforts with something like open air, which by the way, has been adopted by the French in all of Latin America, they're trying to do the same thing. Canada, Mexico, uh, uh, Korea, uh, a bunch of other countries that don't remember now. So there is something good that is done. And yes, well, so the database contribution is there in, in this much bigger issue. And of course, um, open air is not part of ACM, although there is some collaboration uh, uh, that, that is starting with some of the techniques, wanting to put them in, in the Lisa library. ECM wants to be at the forefront of, of open science. There are activities there. Um, and and uh, uh, open science is one of 10 task forces that the current president is establishing uh, for what is called ACM 4.0. It's a big initiative to change ACM for the fourth quarter century of this life. Last year, we celebrated 75 years. And in an open call for volunteers around the world, more than 600 people showed up, which is more or less the same number of volunteers that ACM currently has. So it was a huge surprise. Very few from Italy. I will leave you at that. Please join ACM, please help its efforts. And uh, that's it for me. Thank you very much. It's a lot of this very nice talk, but also the view that you gave us on open science and open research. I think it's important for us to, to know about these things. We open for questions. You know? <clears throat> Yeah, and it's, and SQL started as uh, a guest. It was a, it was, it was a, a generally programming language hosting SQL. Then for a, for a while, SQL has tried to be independent. So I, to have uh, its own extent. Then uh, after a while, uh, the, uh, the, 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 uh, how it's called the big merge, the map reduce paradigm comes actually was the field of map reduce that they try to give uh, a reduced role to SQL and uh, but he start giving fund user the fund function because the main point of uh, map reduce is that uh, you just the user was just required to give the functions that how to, to perform uh, the map and the, the particular the, the reduce. Now it seems that with this approach, so it's a sort of revenge of SQL. SQL has become, has become the host. It's not anymore the guest, but it's the host. So you have. Uh, the, the, the inside as well, and you call the things you cannot manage. That's it. The, the, my question is the, so a bit a congratulations because this is a, a nice range for as well, and for the people who will spend the life of this uh, topic. But uh, how the end user, uh, how easy, how because it's complex, actually, uh, you know, uh, management. Because it's not easy to to define.
fai le fai sono in cui in le scuole quelli io tengo che de dei quel piccano per poter dire poco la roba well uh, uh, whether something becomes popular or not it depends on on, on many things uh, i i feel that this well has the potential of being one of the reference points for how you deal with the impedance mismatch between Python and SQL. And, and I gave you a glimpse of the uh, reasons for this uh, for this optimism. Um, but how easy it will be uh, on the usability, it is relatively easy. The learning curve to learn, if you know SQL, uh, the learning curve of having your Python code and or, or some other language, I mean, I only talked about Python, but as I said, it's transpiler, so we can do uh, uh, other languages. Uh, uh, learning how to embed user-defined functions in, in the context of the SQL is not a problem. It's a small learning function, uh, learning curve. And the results from our usability study with 380 students were very, very good. Uh, we can, there, there are no tools there, they were writing code. If we have the tools, if people start to pick up on the SQL, Okay, uh, then I, I think it will be a, a smooth, a smooth step. So I'm very optimistic in terms of that. Oh, this is really very, very short, and uh, it's uh, related to what you ask. Do you imagine that uh, in some moment the vendors of uh, DBMS or classical DBMS like Oracle, uh, DB2, etc., would be interested in including things like these uh, within their frameworks? Because I think. You know, when we started, the, when we worked on uh, optimization, no, uh, on a relational, uh, on uh, yeah, relational algebra, etc., then many of those things have been included, of course, as optimizations in uh, classical DBMSs. Do you think this kind of research also will influence uh, these vendors, or because I think that finally, of course, they, uh, the, the, the traditional DBMSs are useful for a, a large number of applications, but they really risk to become obsolete at a certain time. This could be something that really improves that so, so do you think uh, it will happen? Um, every single system, a prototype or commercial, has its own mechanism for user-defined function. So it, it, it is already there. So I have two answers. One is the techniques that are there, and I've we demonstrate them, you know, conclusively uh, how they work, how important they are, what impactful they are. They may be incorporated, like this happened in the past, and especially what we do and what I hope will do more in terms of uh, fusion is very critical. Uh, on, on the other hand, um, uh, uh, the, the yes well paradigm, which also has linguistic aspects that are not just the techniques for processing and optimization and so on. Uh, it is a harder bet to win and everyone say, we won't use now this for using SQL. But um, uh, uh, I mean, SQL plus plus from, from UC San Diego, uh, that you know, uh, another Yanis and his team uh, there picked up and did, it has been uh, uh, taken by, uh, by by IBM, by Couchbase, and a whole bunch of other systems. So, uh, yes, we can, I can dream and, uh, that, that yes, well, because of, again, of the usability and the cleanliness, because we, we do all the dirty stuff and it has the impact. Uh, <laughs> yeah, so I, I, I hope. Hello. Hello, Yanis, and thanks for the talk. I have a question on open science matter that is very interesting. In real life, a lot of projects, especially at the EU level and US level, oblige you uh, like, uh, like a secret not to deliver data, methodology, and product in some cases. And so, and so I don't see how the, the open science world will comply with the project in real life, in many nations, in many countries in the world. Um, uh, this may have been the case. It may still be the case in certain contexts, but this is changing for sure. Uh, I said, I mean, bottom up, 
uh, people want the democratization of science. So they are asking for openness, but people asking, I mean, eventually has to reach the ears of the top people and then, but now there are the mandates. In the European Union Commission, any project that we get from, uh, uh, from the sea, uh, you have to have all your publications openly available, your data sets openly. So you cannot go out with it. This is the modus operandi of Horizon Europe, ERC, and, and all of them. In the US, it's suggestion, but January 1st, 2026, uh, uh, it is done. And in a whole bunch of other countries. So in two, in three years, what you, what you are uh, uh, describing will not exist. Every government will have this open policy. Some countries are ahead, some can't. Let's look at the European Union. Of the 27 countries, some have open access policies, some or open science policies in general, some do not. But they are doing them as, as we speak. And the European Open Science Club provides a framework for pushing this. Soon everyone will pull them. Thank you. Hi, um, thank you for your presentation. And I have two questions. The first one is if uh, yes, SQL uh, exploits also the GPU computation because I did not understand this part. And the second is if you think that uh, yes, SQL can be extended also for uh, using also other kinds of data structures like, for example, graphs or something like that. Uh, the first one, you asked about GPUs, right? Yeah. Uh, it is an orthogonal issue. Uh, uh, I mean, there is a database system or the data management system it doesn't have to be a relational database, although that's what we focused on. And now on what hardware it runs, it is beyond us. SQL is above the data, the database system, the data management system. Any optimization that it is doing, uh, as we said, we have a row store or a column store. Optimizations are very different there. Whether you take advantage of the, the GPU or the, uh, uh, or, or the CPU or other uh, uh, special accelerators or software, or you take into account the cache. This is not the job of SQL. It is the job of the, the query optimizer of the system. So uh, if there is GPU underneath, the world, we won't be dealing with that. And, and the second thing is, uh, um, uh, uh, you talk about graph databases. Uh, absolutely. Uh, I mean, graphs can be conceptualized as relations and relations as, as, as graphs in, in some sense. Um, and we haven't touched that at all. I mean, MongoDB and, and others, we, we haven't, uh, uh, or uh, Neo4j, and, and whoever is, is the most popular ones. We haven't done it, but the principle behind it as long as it is SQL based and you want uh, uh, to manipulate it uh, this way, it, it should operate. Right? As I said, in the fourth basement, uh, when you have a SQL query, you're producing a CFFI uh, uh, code, but then you generate some specific database. So more code needs to be uh, uh, produced, to be written in order to be able to produce this thing. For every data source, things will be different. Uh, but I don't see any conceptual obstacle in in uh, uh, in this. So yes, last question. I have seen that a, a increasing, a terrible increasing of cloud database management systems. So my question is: Amazon, Microsoft, and Google are uh, in the line of this evolution of as well. Do you know something? Because the, the, the market is pretty, so Oracle is in five position, and three years ago was outstanding. So this is very boring. And the second question, it's not, not question, very, very simple. It seems from your data that uh, common databases, uh, database management systems are better for your idea. Okay. Yeah. Uh, uh, when you don't have updates, and you have all the analytical things. Uh, uh, I mean, like MonadB, which is our, our favorite one where we've been working on so far, uh, has been proven, and of course, Vertica and others, it's, it's much better. 
Okay. Although the ideas that I, spent, I, I showed work with phosphorus, which is a raw store. So whether it's called for a raw store, um, uh, it thinks the ideas work and improve things. But when it's as analytics, you don't have transactions, you don't have updates, and so on and so forth. Definitely call those are better. Yeah, just to verify that your, your second part. The first part, we haven't worked with distributed uh, uh, or cloud based uh, uh, data systems yet. It was one bullet in my future. In my future work for federated, but also cloud. Um, I um, it, it, it is an application that they uh, worry about. Include things, but definitely have user defined things. Uh, the, the ball game there would be a little bit more complicated because we have the distribution, we have the, the sharding and so on, and things going in multiple places. Um, so it's, it's work for the future. I, I believe that uh, uh, because in another effort we're working on, on federated data management, privacy preserving federated data management, which is uh, another another thing. Uh, I don't see this needs to be studied, but I cannot imagine hitting a wall and not being able to do it. How impactful it will be, we'll have to see. I mean, we did it with Spark. Okay, so we, we have run experiments, uh, which is in the cloud direction, let's, let's put it this way. It's parallel is not necessarily cloud. Uh, so we haven't done work with uh, Azure, AWS, and so on and so forth. So it's, it's work for the future, but I'm optimistic. Thanks a lot to Yanis again. <laughs> So uh, now there is the coffee break just out of here, and I invite those with a presentation in the next two sessions, come, come to me and give your presentation. And remember, if you have the poster, to talk to the registration desk so that they can place it. And see you here at 11.15 sharp. Thank you. I'm going to be adjusting my presentation for tomorrow. What's going on? Can I Sì, comunque secondo me bisognerebbe togliere cose che non possono collegarsi su quanto su questo, perché secondo me tutta la gente che si collega mi fa cambiare la vita. Eh, però c'è cioè, il titolo l'ho usato solo per fare streaming e basta. Perché è sempre andato, il problema è che non abbiamo mai dato il codice per collegarsi. E vai, 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 v
in ogni caso no ma c'è tanta gente secondo me cioè non c'è perché non è uno che fa le streaming e uno per collegarsi con tutti gli altri no è come tu di casi No, per inglese, perché qui si parla inglese, cioè capisci? No, infatti guardiamo solo la nostra presentazione e poi dopo ci sono. Possono collegarsi con l'internet del posto? Che c'è? Sì, però l'internet del posto ha un pochino sugli occhi, quindi arrivano qua e pensate che non posso farlo grazie il mese di guadagnare stacco ah, stacco